So we know that children are digitally savvy. We want them to be information savvy. What are some quick wins and what are some longer term goals that we should have? It just occurs to me, gentlemen, as we've been discussing this, particularly about the way we frame the discussion, that looking at two previous uh, ways of approaching things, the Green Cross Code and Stranger Danger, I, I can see a real difference with the approach there. Stranger Danger sounds terrifying, doesn't it? The Green Cross Code sounds like something you have to do, but it's green and it allows you to carry on uh, behaving in a, in, in a responsible way. So um, what are the quick wins that we can, we can have, do you think? Are there any, or should we now be looking longer term? I think what's, what's interesting, we, we talk about um, the, the, the BCS certificate in, in e-safety, for me, is a quick win because it enables schools to frame their curriculum around an external qualification that, that is certified and um, gives them a broader spectrum because we, we talk about e-safety but actually the qualification picks up other issues such as um, are your settings on your Internet Explorer correct, are your, do you know how to deal with the virus, which is a much broader thing outside of e-safety but is part of that process of being safe when you're in an online environment. I think for me that's a, a quick win, schools can adapt it, adopt it um, and they can fit it in with what they're already doing and where they've got holes they can fill them in. And when the likes of Ofsted come in inspecting the school, they've actually got something that says we are on that path. Mm. It's not the end of the road, but it's going down that path because along that road you've also got to pick up how do we address parents, how do we deal with governors. And I know that uh, South West Grids 360 Degrees Safe picks up that whole school element um, from the top, from the senior management team all the way down, also picking in school governors, picking up the community, and I think that is sort of the process you want to go down, whether it's through the 360 degrees safe that South West Grid for Learning do, or whether you, you take it and uh, adopt a slightly different model, but it's going down that whole school philosophy that brings in the community as well. But that's much more longer term because you are trying to turn a school in a particular direction, yeah. and that requires quite a bit of time and effort. On 360 Safe, the data we've just got back from 360 Safe indicates the school, when they've self assessed themselves on the tool, one of the weakest parts is staff training, and that comes out across the board. Um, it may even be reflected in the data that we're getting from the US as well mm -hmm. that staff training is at a very, very low level. So, if the BCS um, qualification enables a school to increase that staff knowledge and training, then I see no drawbacks to that. Um, in my point of view, the more that we educate school staff, the better. And if they incorporate that into the whole school, and as we've talked about before, the whole school um, ethos around child safety, not just ICT advisor, he can do that, not just the, the, the child protection officer, they can do that, but actually as part of the ethos of the whole school, mm. then that's a great help. What about a longer term? What should we be doing here, Dave? Well, I, I go back to an earlier comment I made, which I think, you know, um, as well as the, you know, the curriculum based stuff which is clearly very very important and a quick win, we, we have to in society recognise that conversation I talked about earlier on has to happen yeah. between parents and children. Even if that question is to ask well what are they teaching you at school <laughs> about ICT and so on. And I think there's a role there for uh, you know, governors bodies, parents associations or groups around school and those kind of things to make sure that parents and schools are in communication with each other. Um, about technology. I think in the long term, um, I think there is a general tr generational transition going on. And that, you know, today's 15 or 20 year olds are very different to people, let's say, over 35. And unfortunately, sometimes with new innovation and new technologies and all the wonderful things that those create in both the workplace and at home, there are, shall we say, challenges and dislocations. And I think we're working through that. I think we're coming through some of the worst aspects of that, and I think we're now getting onto a much more level playing flat field. And I think in the next 10 years, we're going to reap some real benefits from the internet. And I think we're going through that gener generational stage, and I think schools and parents can play a pivotal role in making that happen. Lovely. Final comments, gentlemen. Gentlemen. For me, if I'm sticking with um, future, sorry, for the future wins uh, for me, I think the internet is fantastically dynamic. It moves so fast, it changes so fast, and it's a great environment, and there's so much and so much we can do with it, and so many ways we can engage the youth with it. But I think we need to be constantly reviewing what we do. 
we need to be on top of this. I think it's really important that e-safety or internet safety is part of a school curriculum. I think it should be across the board. Government should make it part of the school curriculum, in my personal view, because I don't think it's going to go away. Um, engaging the parents can be done through that as well. But for me, school curriculum, keep on top of it, keep changing, keep pushing. It would be handy if we had a snappy title for, for this, wouldn't it? Like the Green Cross Code for our online... Um I can't think of one. If you can brainstorm one now, that'd be lovely. I would but, love uh, to just... Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Perhaps worth some thoughts. J uh, concluding points. Jeremy. I think we need to understand the, the evolving nature of, of the subject matter. Um, what we understand as e-safety today might be something different in a year or so's time. Mm. New, new social networking technologies come on board and so on. What we understood as e-safety five years ago was, was something different again. So I, I think we need to... to take into account emerging technologies and indeed technologies which are now becoming more and more exploited. Um, so mobile technologies for example. Um, Ofcom's recent research suggests that 35% of 12 to 15 year olds have a smartphone. So, so clearly the use of social technology, uh, social media technologies and so on is going to become more and more prevalent on mobile devices and that takes people out of the living room or out of the classroom so I think we just need to be cognizant of the, of the ways in which uh, the situation can evolve um, and the subject matter will evolve. Um, I just wanted to, to just paraphrase or, or take a quote from a recent Guardian article by uh, uh, Stephen Carrick Davis, um, which talks about a, a new three R's of literacy um, and that these three R's of literacy would help us to understand the risks, better manage online reputations and together build resilience to cope with the contradictions and opportunities of the online world. And I think that quite neatly sums up what we've been discussing today. Thank you. I think that resilience aspect, I think I would also say, is we've got to start looking at e-safety as part of a, a set of life skills, new life skills that are appearing. Yeah. There's um, a lot of countries around the world, particularly in Asia, that actually talk about digital well-being. So in other words, Online safety isn't just about identity, but it's also about viruses, spam, identity theft, all those kind of things. And so it's quite a broad spectrum. And that life skill, that uh, digital well-being, is something I think in the next five to ten years we need to look at. Mm. Look at it more of a, as a lifestyle, almost health issue, as opposed to a technology issue, yeah. which is the way we've been looking at it and the way the media often looks at it. And I think if we can reframe it around that uh, that that approach, I think we'll, we'll get a lot more progress um, and I think there's much more upsides to dealing with the issue with children like that. Yeah. The digital well-being code, there we go. Could be. I mean, you, you, uh, Paul Howard Jones called it hygienic use of the internet or hygienic use of technology, uh, which is probably a bit too clinical. Um, but I think we, we, there are two things. One is that constant dialogue with the children and I think that is benefit I get from going into lots of schools is to, the constant talking to children about what they're doing with technology and how they're adapting it. Texting wasn't really designed to be as children have used it, it was you know, we'll put it in because it's there mm. and children embraced it and that was why they had a mobile phone. Now they've got Blackberries because it's, it's, you know, Blackberry messaging is, is such a powerful tool for them. The, the move now is well are, and we talk about you know, health issue, does, does the use of social networks start to flatten the relationship? Now, am I just dipping in and out of this relationship? Why is it a proper relationship? Am I actually talking to them or am I just exchanging the odd bit of text with them? Mm. I think, as we've said, there is huge benefit from all these tools and technologies. The fact that children can talk to people in other worlds, other, other, other countries. Um, Give it but, time, it will be other worlds. Yes, <laughs> um, but, but they, 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 they can experience other cultures. They can talk to people yeah. in other, other areas and they can begin to see the benefits of it um, beyond just their own social circle.